Now, how do I make this graph go away? Uh, hmm. Well, that's annoying. Um, um, okay. I'm also going to turn on this subtitles because I've been told it's, it's valuable for accessibility. Uh, I know it won't do a perfect job and some of the words will come out rather silly, but at least uh, hopefully some people will benefit from this and I'll hopefully get that thing out of the way. Okay, so I'm gonna talk primarily about Sickle. I wanted to mention the other things because I felt like it was important to clarify some of the things Intel was doing while I was here, um, but that's really not the focus. I'm, I'm gonna talk about maintainability, portability, and Sickle with a little bit on the side. So, oh God, this, is anyone, how do I make, oh, there we go. Does anyone know how to make this bar go away? Uh, hide floating. It looks fine for us, Jeff. We don't see the bar. Oh, okay, sorry. It's, this is very strange. It's showing things to me that floating bars. Okay, all right. So this is, this is the motivation. Obviously, many of you are not in the US uh, and this is not designed to be a US exascale centric talk at all. It's just to point out um, sort of an interesting I told you so moment for those of us that believe in open standards. So 10 or so years ago, when we started talking about exascale, the in the US Department of Energy lab system, uh, we had sort of the blue gene family. And then there was this, you know, emerging GPU family, which at the time was, you know, dominated by NVIDIA. Uh, and, and to some extent still is. Um, and you know, so people were focused on programming blue gene and GPUs, and then they sort of, you know, blue gene was a lot like all the other CPUs uh, from, you know, from most perspectives. So people didn't really have to think about it. And they, they wrote lots of CUDA and, and they thought they were doing the right thing. And here we are at Exascale and, you know, the, the blue gene line is dead. Um, Xeon Phi line is, is not exactly going anywhere. Although, you know, many, many CPUs uh, have, have, you know, 50 plus cores or will in the future. So obviously many core has become normative. Um, I think you can even buy a desktop now with at least 32 cores in it for gaming. Um, but what, we've, what we clearly see as a lesson from this is, well, if you don't plan to write code 10 years in the future um, for architectures that you haven't seen yet, you might end up feeling bad about yourself and end up having to throw away a lot of code. Now, if you like throw away code, fine. Um, write non-portable code for every machine that comes along. And there's certain people who, who I'm sure enjoy that. Uh, and if you're a Blas library developer, that's the appropriate thing to do. But for the vast majority of scientific applications, we need to have at least a 10-year perspective. These systems are usually five to seven years. So your, your code outlives the system and it may outlive the architectural uh, generation that, that is associated with the machine. So, you know, focus on standards. That's the message. So. Um, I'm going to assert that this, these are the three pillars of portable parallel programming. I'm sure that there will be people who will want to argue with this, but this is uh, my assessment of things as they are today. So there are the, th the first pillar is the pillar that is based on the evolution of existing ISO language code. So the ISO languages here means Fortran, C, C++, and pretty much all the vintages or most of the features of all the vintages are supported in those. So you can go, you can add OpenMP to Fortran 77, you can add it to OpenMP to C++ 17. Um, there are a handful of features that OpenMP has not decided to support yet. You know, the composition of um, Fortran co-rays and OpenMP, I'm not sure if it's been defined yet or if it is, it's very recent. So there's some things that aren't perfectly well-defined, but the fact is, OpenMP is the pillar where you take your existing, uh, probably MPI, uh, MPI plus Fortran, MPI plus C, et cetera, and add OpenMP uh, directives or pragmas and evolve that forward. And you can obviously do that with CPU code and with GPU code and potentially other accelerators. I think, you know, then NEC Aurora is supported by OpenMP as well. Um, and so, so that's the first pillar and, and one I, I think is pretty great and I'm using on a regular basis with NWCAM. The second pillar, which is obviously newer um, and is a little bit language specific, 
uh, is based on modern C++. And modern C++ is C++11 or newer. Um, and, and this is an important distinction. Um, I recently gave an internal talk on you know, modern versus classical C++, and there's some very smart people who know C++ better than me who point out these are two different languages. They're, it's just there's a hard there's a hard transition in idiomatic C++ around 2011, and and modern C++ is really should be used as a different language, although it is conveniently con a compatible language with classic C++ in the same way that classic C++ is compatible with C. Um, and in the modern C++ world, if you want to build portable, parallel, heterogeneous style programming, there are there are two solutions. Uh, so one of them is Sickle, and Sickle is probably new to a lot of people, and I'll, I'll put some intro uh, on that topic. And the other is Coco. So I'm a big fan of Coco. So Coco is developed by Sandia. It's been around for a little while. They actually were successful with um, C++ prior to 2011, although Cocos gets a lot easier to use and easier to, to port um, with modern C++ features. Um, and I think they're very rapidly um, moving to a C++ 11 and later support. Um, but but this is this is really a, another pillar that works really well if you if you like modern C++. But the fact is, if you hate modern C++ or just hate C++ in general, this pillar is not for you. Uh, and I don't think there's anything that can happen uh, to change that. And that's okay, because uh, there's always open OpenAPI. And then finally, uh, and, and Lorena, uh, you know, alluded to this when she talked about you know writing Python interfaces to existing high performance library code. Uh, her group already had. Um, the, the other method you can use is, is some form of scripting languages, and I use Python as example because um, it's pretty popular in HPC, but we see, it, you know, Julia is also there. Um, and then, of course, you can get the performance part of uh, your uh, scripting language ecosystem with libraries, assuming those libraries exist, of course. There are um, lots and lots of libraries in Python for data analytics and AI. Um, deep learning is, you know, there's a lot of that stuff there. There's a lot of dense linear algebra support. Um, there isn't necessarily a, you know, um, import, you know, uh, unstructured adaptive mesh CFD with, you know, whatever something else in their library. And so, obviously, your how effective you can be depends on your domain and and the domain support uh, for libraries. But um, and and I don't talk about MPI three at all here. Um, but I have been working on MPI for a long time. Uh, and I don't see any change in MPI being the bedrock uh, for HPC for the vast majority of applications. There's obviously a place for PGAS for some people, um, and I know that some of the data analytics world um, uses Spark. NERSC, I think, has, you know, Berkeley Labs uh, DOE Center has uh, some serious Spark usage for genomics, as far as I understand, but it's not broadly usable. Uh, or broadly applicable. So this is this is the three pillars. And just because it's you know it's easy to be uh, right when you look uh, at things you've already seen, I'll just make a prediction. Um, three years from now, uh, if I if I come back and talk to you all again, you can call me out on this. So my prediction is this won't actually change. That what will change over the next few years is we'll get MPI four, and that's great. Um, we'll get Open MP six, that's great. What it will be interesting is that we will see features of Sickle and Cocos and things like them move into the C++ standard. So I don't know when exactly this happens. It's already started with C++ 17. Uh, it will continue with 20 and 23 and 26 and 29 and who knows what else. Um, but, but, but this is a good thing because this means that it gets easier and easier to use these things. They become more and more normative and almost certainly they won't be breaking things along the way. It'll just be, you know, Cocos might shrink every few years in the number of lines of code, or the Sickle compiler front end might become less and less of an extension to Clang um, as things move into the core language. And, and this is great. This is how, how, how programming models evolve. Um, the other thing that may happen, um, and I know some folks working on this, is that the coverage of code in scripting languages um, may be able to grow because we are getting, you know, just-in-time compilation and, you know, things like Numba and, and things we've learned from Julia on how to do uh, dynamic languages uh, with high performance. Julia has run at Petascale um, on the NERSC Cray supercomputer, for example, 
um, you know, they hit actual petaflops um, with Julia. So it, you don't have to stick to Fortran and, and C++ to, to get good performance um, if you've got the right infrastructure. And, and we may see the scripting language ecosystem uh, compiler technology get better and better such that you need, uh, or either you need libraries less often or you can build things without the existence of all the libraries um, it might be possible to write some of those codes natively and, and JIT compile them to something fast. So one of the things I'm, I'm very big on is uh, legacy code is good. Um, I mean, unless you know it's bad and then fine, but, but, but there's, there's a lot of computer science uh, research, academics, you know, thought leader type people who, who think that you have to go crazy and throw your code away. And um, I assume folks know about Stack Overflow. Uh, the guy who co-created Stack Overflow has this wonderful article um, from the year 2000 about the fall of Netscape. And uh, the lesson here is pointed out is um, they decided to throw away their code and start over. And it wasn't just, you know, their research code or their PhD code or their postdoc code. This was actual Netscape, one of the most widely used software packages, and they thought it was a good idea to start over. And in the process, they they killed their entire um, whatever, their, their company, uh, their product, and were replaced by other things. Um, and, and so the lesson here is, and please read the article because there's a lot of details in there, but um, don't throw code away just because you think it's better to write new code, um, improve code. Uh, evolve code, add new code, deprecate old code, remove old code, do things like that, but do it as part of the life cycle of software and not uh, because you, you're you embarrassed somehow that you're using code that's um, 10 or 20 years old. There's nothing inherently wrong with old code. It's it's what the code is that matters. And and this is a this is a lesson I learned about new things aren't always better. Um, Dave, Dave Goodell is a world-class software engineer uh, he was at Argonne for a while. He's back at Amazon. Um, and, and at one point, I, I was feeling bad that I was a Vim user um, surrounded by a bunch of Emacs users. And, and Dave's actually, I think, a Vim user. He was at the time. And he, he basically said, he told me, stop feeling bad about using Vim. Um, it wasn't the reason I was not effective as an editor of code wasn't that I was using Vim and I needed to learn Emacs. It was that I was using Vim poorly and that I needed to spend a lot more time learning how to use Vim better. Uh, and I, I learned a valuable lesson about, about bo both about you know, text editors and IDs, but I also learned, okay, instead of thinking about the next cool thing, what I really need to do is learn the tools um, that I'm already good at better, uh, practice them better, um, and then I'll be you know, a better Vim programmer and more effective without having to start over and learn Emacs, which I've never actually learned. So worked out. So, um, you know, many, many things to do better. This is sort of just a transition slide. Um, but, you know, if you like Fortran, there's nothing wrong uh, with writing Fortran. Just learn to use Fortran better. If you're C89, learn, learn to use C better. All, learn to use all the things that you're using better. Evolve to use the, the new components that are associated with them or, or use new idioms. Um, if you're using C++, look at the modern C++ features and see if it makes your code better. Um, and the great thing there is you don't have to delete all your old C++ code just to add some new C++. Um, one thing that people absolutely need to do is learn to use OpenMP better. Uh, if you write OpenMP parallel do all over the place like you know Quantum Espresso does, that's kind of an anti-pattern. Uh, it really should be improved. Um, lots of people should use to learn, it, learn to use MPI better. Um, you know, there are more than 10 functions in the standard. And you know, it, if all else fails, if you if you have Fortran, you feel bad about, it and you realize that you need to use C++ for whatever reason, um, don't delete all your Fortran and try to rewrite it. Learn to use mixed language programming better. And there are features in modern Fortran with 2003 that lets you do that uh, in an effective way. Uh, so you can write new code in C++ while writing. Um, glue code and maintaining modules, just like, you know, uh, Lorena's group was able to bolt Python onto, you know, optimized uh, compiled libraries. So th th there's something 
terribly wrong with the world when when people are taught or encouraged or even tolerated to you know throw away million line fortran code bases and start over and um, turn them all into modern c plus plus as if that magically makes them better so i'm going to talk about modern c plus plus for heterogeneous systems and not all these other topics which i wish i had time for but i don't so i'm going to go whirlwind tour of modern c plus plus and and parallelism this is obviously trivial code take two uh, stl vectors of floats and you know take the pro inner product of one of them and accumulate it into the other and this is you know this is valid this is valid in lots of languages obviously or you know old old c plus plus new c plus plus if you change the arrays it would be a c um, but we can change this to loops with lambdas uh, and ranges and i do this for continuity um, in general i don't recommend doing this just for the sake of using ranges uh, and lambdas, et cetera. But it, it is a very natural thing to try out as you transition to some of these modern C++ parallel models. We can parallelize those loops. So you can take a STD for each and you can turn it into a TBB parallel for each and nothing changes except the code now will run in parallel. Um, this may or may not be a good idea, of course, to be you know, a fine grained inner loop parallelism is not always the right thing to do, but for the sake of this example, um, this would run in parallel if you had a big long vector. Um, you can do the same thing with parallel STL as of C++ 17, and you can use this parallel unsequenced policy unsequenced sort of maps onto SIMD, give or take. Um, and, and you can see Cocos has something similar, Raja has something similar, HPX, etc. cetera. Um, in this project, I, I have, um, it's called the parallel research kernels, which you can find on GitHub. I don't have a link here, but I, I, it's easy enough to find if you Google for it. It's also on my GitHub profile. Um, you could see the same thing there. And I've, I've, I've written um, this type of code and other things in many, many different languages. If you want to read the uh, side by side of Cocos versus TBB, for example, you can learn that. So now i'm going to talk about sickle one to one um and this is th this obviously is a little bit more complicated and i'll explain this stuff um the and sickle does get better but there are there, here are the important features so at the top we see that there's a sickle queue you have to tell sickle that there's a device um and tell it which one to use in this case you can pick the default you create sickle buffers from host data um, this is a really elegant model i know it adds extra lines of code um, that aren't required in other types of heterogeneous models, but there is there is something incredibly valuable about the semantic information you provide to the runtime and the compiler when you create these buffer objects. Um, then you submit work to the queue. So that's work submission is a familiar concept for you know heterogeneous programming. Um, these accessors, these are the part that, you know, uh, some of our users have, have been unhappy with the verbosity, but they're actually, again, a powerful semantic for letting the compiler and runtime reason about data motion. Um, and then you have the parallel four, looks almost exactly like all the other parallel fours that have come before it on these slides. And then, of course, because you submitted work to a heterogeneous device, um, uh, you, you wait on it if you actually want to look at the result. So this is Sickle 2020, uh, which um, I know some of the folks on the call uh, contributed to, um, especially the folks at CodePlay, uh, just was released and you know, compiler work is, is in progress, although you know, Intel and CodePlay are both making, making a lot of progress here. So the simplification here is if you wanted to use pointers uh, instead of buffers and accessors, you could absolutely do that, and you'd have this malloc shared, which you know sort of is like the unified memory model we see in some other uh, heterogeneous models. Um, and then you can actually um, simplify the code a little bit in, in in the kernel code. We can make this a little bit simpler. Um, this uh, isn't actually part of Sickle yet. It's it, it's um, this is in our compiler. Um, because we had some people who were like, that's too many lines of code, make it even simpler. And so you can, turns out you can fold the, um, the handler and the queue methods together and just do parallel for direct submission to the queue and it behaves the same way. And if you look at the sickle language rules, you realize this is, this is just a header trick actually, there's nothing, 
um, there's nothing magical. There's no, I don't even think compiler support is needed. The only thing that's required here is actually just, you know, legalizing having these methods be associated with different classes. Um, and, and we'll continue to work with Kronos. So hopefully this thing will be standard, but if it's, if it's not standard, you know, anybody can do it in a header file uh, if they want. So why, why sickle? Um, so the first thing is OpenCL, which is a, you know, a well-known standard for heterogeneous programming, has a well-defined portable execution model. Um, a lot of people don't like it. So um, I, I, work for, I used to work for Tim Matson, who, who's done a lot with OpenCL. He likes it a lot. Um, I, even though I like Tim a lot, I, found, I still found it hard to learn. Um, it, I think Simon and company made this header file that makes my life a lot easier. But still, even if you can make all the host code simpler, um, it still lacks modern C++ support, and that's an issue for a lot of people who modern C++ is really important to. Um, so Sickle is based entirely on modern C++. It it's, does not have any backwards compatibility duct tape to C++03, which is, I think, a beautiful design decision. There are other GPU programming models that are trying to be backwards. Hello? Somebody's gonna have to tell me if I'm back because I just lost internet. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Jeff. We've got you back, mate. How 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 long ago did you did you lose this entire slide? Most of it. Oh, okay, but but at least that's only this slide, correct? You've yeah, you seen covered, uh, some of the open CL. Uh, perhaps if you could just pick up where with stickle in the middle. Second. Oh, great. Okay, that's a that, that I, sometimes the VPN takes minutes before it, it actually tells me it dies. This is wonderful. Um, okay, so uh, so Sickle's modern C++. It, it doesn't it doesn't apologize for that. It doesn't have any of the backwards compatibility or, you know, support or, you know, tell you, you, you might want to write functors. It just says, hey, lambdas are here. They're great. Use them. Um, and, and it allows single source heterogeneous programming. And that's really one of my favorite parts is not having to split kernel and host code. You just read top to bottom, it's there. Um, so Sickle is also nice and it's similar to TBB and Parallel STL. So if you happen to be writing TBB or Parallel STL for modern C++ threading on CPUs, well then Sickle sort of allows you to evolve toward that. And I know most of the HPC world doesn't use either of these things, um, but, but Sickle is about more than just HPC. Uh, and so it's nice for you know people out there who are, you know, whatever, engineering and graphics and rendering and all those things that exist um, where TBB actually gets used uh, a little bit more, um, it, it, you can evolve from CPU to heterogeneous uh, modern C++. So, um, so Sickle, you know, isn't the first model that is designed to support heterogeneous computing, but it's the first standard one. Uh, and it's really the first one that committed to modern C++ as the foundation. So um, I'm a bit, like I said, I'm a big fan of Cocos, you know, and Cocos is open source and very, a very open community, but it's not a standard. Um, and that can matter to people, you know, it's, there's no Cocos language specification. I don't know how you would, you know, hold a vendor to a contract involving Cocos. Um, but, you know, when it comes to Sickle, there is a literal book that you can throw at somebody and say, give me this or I don't buy your hardware. And that's a very powerful thing. I've been on both sides of that negotiation. Um, standards are good for not just for programmers, but also for purchasing. So the, this is the Sickle ecosystem. There are four good compilers out there that have different backends. But if you look, I'm not going to go through all the fine print. This is on the Kronos website. I encourage you to look at it. What you can see here is one or more compilers for every CPU that I know of, um, every CPU that's supported by LLVM at least, um, all the GPUs, including Intel CPUs, NVIDIA CPUs, and AMD CPUs all show up here. Assuming of course, you know, for AMD, you know, you have to have HIP um, and not all AMD GPUs support HIP, but that's not a sickle problem. Um, and you can support all the OpenCL Spear V devices. And that means that you get things like Intel FPGAs, 
uh, and our Mali, which I don't have any have in any of my hardware, but it exists, and and even some other things. Um, and and I don't really know the status of Xilinx or their implementation, but um, Ronan Cariol is a huge. Uh, contributor to the SICA world, world um, and he has an open source implementation, which is actually the one I use on my laptop um, because it's headers. Um, it doesn't even require a compiler, which is great. So this, this is really to say this is a vibrant, growing uh, ecosystem. This is not some speculative, oh my goodness, will my hardware be supportive? You can look on here. It's hard to, hard to see any interesting HPC hardware that isn't supported uh bicycle already and and therefore there's a really strong foundation to go off and be portable um, i'm not aware of any ecosystem uh that competes with this in terms of portability openmp for example doesn't support um fpgas or or any of these weird accelerators that i that i don't use um and and similar for open acc uh you know they they claim support for fpgas in a research compiler that only supports c so that's not as not the same um so i i know tom's speaking tomorrow so i'll just say uh tom and simon and and folks at bristol do amazing work um some of that work is already on youtube and on the internet and on github uh and so i'm not going to go through this because i hope tom will go through it better tomorrow um, and this is another fine uh, piece of work by some folks at Argonne, who I know. Um, so I had nothing to do with this, and it's uh, I, I, I cite it because one, you don't have to take my word for it, but also um, because they they compared on other hardware that I'm I'm not allowed to publish performance numbers on. So, but this is this is a study of the Raja Perf uh, kernels, and they have another another uh, application in the paper. But what you can see here that's really interesting is I can't remember which direction red and blue are. Uh, versus of CUDA versus Sickle. You can read the paper for details. What you can see is there's winners and losers. Um, I don't know why. I'm sure that somebody at NVIDIA can fix this and make all of the, uh, skew the entire thing to, 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 so that CUDA always beats Sickle. Um, but, but, you know, these are, these are, these are smart people who write code for a living. Um, and, you know, they see that, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And if you look at the, you know, geomene of this, um, it's probably a pretty good deal to go off and write sickle, particularly uh, since that code will run on more than one device um, and doesn't have any uh, license encumbrances. So lastly, programming isn't about the code you write. It's uh, in your direct programming language. It's also about the code you don't write. It's not enough to just have a programming language. People don't use Python the way they do just because Python is a great language. They use it because there's like 150,000 modules that they can import. Um, same thing is true for Perl and JavaScript and all those things. C++ has a gigantic library. The, uh, you have to have a library ecosystem. And so the point of this transition is just to say, uh, you know, with what we're doing, uh, on this front is recognizing that you also have to have the library. So this is the One API industry initiative, which means this is um, this is an open thing. Uh, this is all on GitHub or on websites as an open specification. Um, there, we're separating out you know, the notion of a specification from an implementation. So while we do implement all these things, obviously uh, the specifications and the and the interface code is available for others to use and implement and there's already been some work by CodePlay to take some of the library interfaces and to map them onto NVIDIA libraries so that you can actually take advantage of this and use um, the, the, the BLAS library features um, on NVIDIA GPUs, not just Intel. Um, and you, so you can go to oneapi.com and find links to all the specs. Um, all the stuff is open. And then of course, there's an Intel product implementation. If you want to try something, um, you can actually do like apt-get one API um, and the instructions are on the website. You can email me if there are questions, um, but that's, uh, anyway, so that's, this is the important compliment, which is to say, if, if you're gonna write heterogeneous code, uh, you probably also want some heterogeneous libraries to help you out and, and things like the blahs are, are, you know, an absolutely essential part of that. Uh, and lastly, um, my colleague Andy Mallinson uh, asked me to make sure that you all knew about uh, the his his team of folks in the UK who who are um, you know professional 
RSC equivalents, uh, working on HPC and AI. Um, so this is Andy's email. If you don't know Andy already, um, you can reach out to him uh, to talk about uh, co-design, uh, et cetera. So that's it. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions, so I'll read a few out and then as more come in, perhaps Jeff, you'll be able to answer them in the, in the Q&A window. So the, so the first one is from Lawrence Mitchell. And Lawrence has, uh, has said, I use many libraries. Do they all have to agree on a heterogeneous programming model? If yes, how do we square this circle? So I would say if you're talking about temporal composition, meaning uh, foo, then bar, you know, then blah, blah, blah. Uh, they don't have to agree on the programming model. Uh, there are different types of compatibility and interoperability required. Um, so the first one is really important is uh, they have to let go of the resources when they're done and let um, the next library take over. So if you're talking about GPUs, you know, you can't have the device state be monopolized by one runtime and then the next runtime comes up and it's seg faults. But if you've ever tried to use OpenMP and pthreads and TVB in the same application, you realize that this happens with thread pools on CPU. So this is not a new problem and it really just comes down to library and runtime implementers doing uh, same things. I actually added a feature to OpenMP5 um, in response to resource contention issues we saw on BlueGNP. Um, it, it, we were kind of lazy about getting it into the standard. But anyways, that was about letting go of resources. Uh, the other important factor is if you want to compose libraries together in that fashion, they, and you want to do, you touch the same data, then there needs to be a sort of a data operability uh, principle. And that, for example, in the case of Sickle, you take ownership of a host buffer, um, and then you can release ownership and then you can give it to OpenMP or you can, can convert um, memory handles to other memory handles. Now, if you're on an Intel GPU, for example, we have a single unified GPU runtime under the hood called level zero and you can, everything goes through level zero. And so you can always map uh, an OpenMP target uh, buffer data, whatever you want to call it, pointer to a sickle a uh, USM pointer to an OpenCL thing. Um, I assume that will be true in other contexts, but you know, how it gets uh, implemented is, is TBD. And there are, unfortunately, you know, you think designed by committee is bad, designed by two or three committees working together is even worse. I don't believe we're going to see standardization of interoperability interfaces um, beyond, you know, good old fashioned, turn everything into a void star. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more question here from Drew Parsons. This is a very nice question. Uh, should we consider CUDA and OpenCL to both be deprecated by Sickle? Yes. Um, so, so I won't, I won't, I'll just say CUDA isn't a standard and if you want to be portable and standard, you can't use it um, and leave it at that. Um, the issue with OpenCL is it was a really grand vision and a great idea, but uh, a couple of vendors, not just one, have have really not followed through and made it such the OpenCL ecosystem is not strong. So if you're using OpenCL 1.2, you can run it almost everywhere. Um, but that's that's not really the way you want to live. And you can call it, you can call it OpenCL 3.0 now and say flexible profile and just have the feature bits all say false. Um, but if you look at the Sickle ecosystem, it's actually stronger and bigger than OpenCL. And while Sickle came from OpenCL, it has outgrown it. And Sickle has, you know, it was already implementing non-OpenCL backends, but I I'm not a language lawyer, but I believe in Sickle 2020, this is now optional anyways. So you see HipSickle does Sickle on top of Hip, Sickle on top of CUDA, uh, and Tricycle does Sickle on top of OpenMP and TBB. So yeah, uh, Sickle really is uh, a superset of what OpenCL supports. And I would say if you really were you know, if you if you believed in what OpenCL stood for, um, and you want to actually fulfill it in practice, uh, Sickle Sickle is going to do that a lot more effectively now. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, so.